Well, tonight, uh, this is part two in our prayer series, and I don't see any end in sight. There's so much to talk about concerning prayer. It's been several years since I've had a chance to really uh, teach in depth on prayer, so I'm excited to do that. We've, Of course, we've talked about prayer here and there in just about every sermon, but you know, to really just talk about prayer is so vital. And um, tonight, I want to start by talking about the heart posture of prayer. The heart posture of prayer. You know, prayer involves um, several in key ingredients that will result in successful prayer. In other words, uh, knowing, having some information prior to our prayer from Scripture will help our prayers hit the target and be more effective. And I know that's what you want in your prayer life. You don't want to just go through the motions. There's actually some heart postures, some ingredients that we can become aware of and that we can utilize in our prayer life and get a lot greater results. So I'm going to talk about that tonight. And if we have time, uh, I'll go on and talk about the purpose of prayer and the different types of prayer and what purpose they fall under. I don't know if we'll have time for that. We'll see how it goes. But let's let's jump right into here. The first heart posture of prayer for successful prayer is going to be the heart posture of humility, the heart posture of humility. Let's talk about the definition of humility. Here's some of the biblical definitions of the Greek word for humility. It means to bow down to bring low, to submit, to humiliate, to be meek, and to be needy. These are some of the definitions in the Greek language of the of what the word uh, to humble means. Now let's look at this. Uh, the Apostle Peter writes to us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, a uh, powerful verse that says this, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I love this passage of scripture because it gives us powerful keys to help us understand how to receive from God and the heart posture to receive. And think about this. The Bible says that God resists the proud. If you think you don't need God, you make no room for him in your life. Those that think they are going to do everything on their own, and if it's to be, it's up to me. That is that is what pride says. Now, you know, there's a balance to this because um, not everything is up to God. You know, some things are up to us. Things We've got to take some action. Winners take action. But before we take action as Christians, we should pray and we should be aware that we need God in every situation of our life. And through prayer, we should invite him in to every aspect in every area of our life. And then it's not us doing it on our own in pride and thinking we're a self-made man. Instead, it's going to be us and God co-laboring together. The Bible says that we co-labor with God, which means God has a part and we have a part. And part of us getting God involved in all the areas of our life is the act of prayer. Prayer is an act of humility. Prayerlessness is an act of pride. Prayerlessness says, I don't need God to intervene in my life. I don't need his grace. I don't need his help. Prayerfulness says, Lord, I need you. Help me. I need you. You're the God that created the heavens and the earth. And without you, I can do nothing. You know, it is so scriptural to have these two things right before you. On the one hand, without Christ, without God, I can do nothing. On the other side of it is through Christ, I can do all things. Yes, can I do all things through Christ? Yes. Without Christ, can I do anything? Nothing effective, nothing of eternal significance. So understanding that is a right heart posture and a right balance between humility and pride. And and again, prayerlessness is a key indicator of pride. Prayerfulness is a key indicator of humility. It's that you said, I need you, God. I need you, Father. I need your help. I need your grace in my life. So uh, humility would be the first thing. And we see this practice, just to highlight quickly, the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is the one who got the revelation of righteousness consciousness and that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. But yet in Ephesians chapter 3, we see him say this, For this reason, 
I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, Paul says when he would approach God in prayer, he would bow his knees. He would physically get down and he would kneel. He would lower himself. He would prostrate himself before God. Physical acts of obedience release spiritual power and grace. And so I believe when you literally go low, when you physically bow your knees, you are humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. You're showing submission. You're sh- you're showing that you're bowing your heart to him. That physical act has spiritual consequences. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it all through scripture, men and women of God bowing their knees in prayer. And so there's a practice of how we can humble ourselves. Notice it doesn't say, God is going to humble me. It says, humble yourselves, therefore. This is something I choose to do. I choose to humble myself rather than being in a position for God to humble me or some or circumstances to humble me. The Bible says, pride goeth before destruction uh, and a haughty spirit before a fall. None of us want um, you know, destruction or a fall. So if we humble ourselves, we we tap into the grace and the ability of God, and that that puts us in a great position for success. Amen. The next uh, heart condition or heart posture that I see uh, in the kingdom of God in prayer is honor and respect for God. Honor and respect for God. If you want to turn over to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, you can see honor and respect. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 says this, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now think about this. This is Jesus talking about prayer. This is Jesus teaching on prayer. Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Not just teach us how to pray, but teach us to pray. I would say for most believers, especially if you've been a Christian for a while, you know you should pray, you know some of the concepts of prayer, but you need help to just follow through and do it. And so Jesus taught his disciples on how to pray right here. He says, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now think about this, hallowed be your name. To be honored, to be respected, to be reverenced, that's what he's talking about, to honor, to reverence to respect God's name. That's what he's talking about right here. Now think about this. When you approach God with honor, reverence, and respect, you are actually positioning yourself to be able to receive from God everything that he's promised. Because what you honor and what you respect, you can receive from. We know the opposite of that is true. Because we can see when Jesus went to his own hometown, there was no reverence, no respect for him there. And the Bible says not he would, he, he would, wouldn't do, but the Bible says he could there do no mighty work. In other words, dishonor and familiarity actually shut down the people at Nazareth's ability to receive from God and from the miracles that Jesus did elsewhere. But so the opposite is true. Whenever the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus, she had great reverence and honor and respect for Jesus, and she got her miracle. So approaching God with honor and respect is another heart posture, another heart ingredient that helps us receive from heaven. The next thing we see, the next one I want to talk about is boldness and confidence. Boldness and confidence. Now, You may think, wait a minute, you just talked about honor and respect, and you just talked about humility. How can I have humility and also have boldness and confidence at the same time? What you're going to find in Scripture is that there is what we call truth intention, or there are truths that go down each side of the road, and right in the middle is the middle is where the truth is. So there, there are truths that are held in tension that, yes, this humility thing is true, but also this boldness of, and confidence is true, and you can actually have both of those at the same time. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. The Bible says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points 
tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now think about this. Jesus has passed into the heavens, and he is representing us at the throne of God. He has presented his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. That blood that is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for your sins and mine. So that blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel. We know the blood of Abel, who was murdered by his brother Cain, cried out for vengeance and justice. The blood of Jesus cries out for mercy because the blood of Jesus is the just recompense and payment for the sins of the whole world. Isn't that awesome? Does that mean everybody is saved? No, it means everybody's salvation is paid for, but they still must by faith through grace receive that free gift of salvation and eternal life through Christ Jesus. And so we still have to receive what what has been paid for, but the payment has already been made by the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about that. He's passed into the heavens. His blood is on the mercy seat. And God said, I'll meet with you at the mercy seat. Oh, that's good news. Isn't that wonderful news that God didn't say, when you get it all together, when everything's perfect in your life, when you never sin and you never miss it and you never fail, I'll meet with you then. No, he says, I will meet with you at the mercy seat. That is so awesome. That's so wonderful. Notice that he is our meet mediator. He knows what it's like to be human, and he knows what it's like to be God. And 1 Timothy 2.5, the Bible says this, for there is one God and one mediator. Notice only one. There's not several ways to God. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due times. Because he paid the ransom, because he paid the price, he is the only way into the presence of God. He's the only way to the Father. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ that has paid for our sins and made us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not only that, he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. I love this. It is a throne of grace. The Bible says we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can obtain mercy. The only time you need uh, mercy is when you sinned and failed and missed it. And God says, come boldly to my throne and I will grant you mercy. Isn't that wonderful? When you sin, when you failed, when you've missed it, even if you're a believer, come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy that mercy from God, and then find grace, God's divine empowerment, God's riches, a special manifestation of the divine presence of God, the grace of God, the enabling of God, the empowerment of God, the ability of God within you. Isn't that awesome? It's what the grace of God is, that we can come boldly to this throne and he will divinely empower us in our life with his ability, with his power, with his glory, and with his presence. And when we think about this, we've got to talk about the next ingredient for powerful and successful prayer, and that is righteousness consciousness. Righteousness consciousness. Now, obviously, if you've sinned, then you come boldly to the throne of grace. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, 9, this is a, a, a verse to maintain this righteousness consciousness and to maintain our righteousness. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So you're not going to have righteousness consciousness if you've just sinned, but you can come boldly to the throne of grace and you can Find grace to help in time of need. And you can have that sin uh, washed away. Amen. You can have it washed away. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that awesome? Not only does God forgive us, but he cleanses us of all unrighteousness, helping us maintain our righteousness consciousness. Now, what is this righteousness consciousness? It's living in an awareness that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now we get this from several verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Now, before verse 21 is verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Think about this. You used to be a sinner, but you've become a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm sorry, you can't still be a sinner and and be a new creation. You are either are still a sinner and you need to get saved, or you are a new creation and now you need to grow up spiritually into your new identity and understand your identity and walk out your identity. Joyce Meyer says it this way, your do will catch up with your who. And that's part of the discipleship and learning and renewing of the mind process that transforms us. Therefore, um, you know, the Bible talks about um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. One translation says your spiritual act of worship and be not conformed, Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we become a new creation. And once we become a new creation, we need to learn about what happened to us. What happened to us is we became a, a beloved son and daughter of God. And as we are renewed, we go through the renewal of our mind. Notice it's renewing. You're transformed by the renewing. It's continuous present tense, renewing, not renewal where you arrive at being having a renewed mind, but it's a continuous lifetime process of not only renewing your mind, but maintaining that renewed mind. Because you could have had a renewed mind, but if you neglect the word of God over time, your mind will backslide into your own mind, old mindsets, and you'll start to think like you did before you were born again. That's why Paul says, be uh, transformed, go through a metamorphosis. Matter of fact, that Greek word is metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis, where we see a caterpillar become this beautiful butterfly, something that's earthly and bound to the earth now goes through a transformation, and now it becomes a heavenly creature that can soar through the air. And this is the transforming process that happens as our mind is renewed. So in in, in um, Romans chapter 5, verse 17, we become a new creation. And Paul, in that very same few verses, goes on to verse 21 and says this, For he made him, him being Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That's you and me. He, Jesus became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice the word might. See, this. not everybody is saved. This has been paid for, but it must be received. It must be um, appropriated by faith. And so the new birth, the new, the eternal life, being born again is paid for by the blood of Jesus. But I still have to confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart, God raised him from the dead, according to scripture. And the Bible says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The reason the word might there is because this is contingent on us receiving this gift of salvation, this gift of righteousness. Matter of fact, speaking of a gift of righteousness, Romans 5.17, uh, accompanying verse 5, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, says this, um, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So see here, we see in this passage that Paul said we receive abundance of grace, abundance of unmerited favor. Uh, unmerited favor is favor you didn't earn and favor you don't deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you should get, the, the judgment, the payment for the evil, the wrong, the sin you did. That's mercy. Uh, favor, unmerited favor, is getting what you didn't earn and what you don't deserve because of what Jesus did. This is the scandal of grace, that Jesus gets what we should have got, and we get what he deserves. This is totally unfair, and it's a scandal, but it's a wonderful scandal. It's that we get what we didn't earn. Hallelujah. Because of what Jesus did. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful? This is the grace of God. This is God's power. This is his unmerited favor. And why do we get it? Because 
in the sight of God because of what Jesus did, he looks at us just as if we've never sinned. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 uh, talks about, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, think about that. Justified by faith. Justified. I remember when I first got born again and a man of God was teaching me, he said the, the word justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if you never sinned. E.W. Kenyon says it this way, just as if sin never existed. Glory to God. Approach God in prayer with righteousness consciousness, just as if sin never existed in confidence and boldness, knowing you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't this wonderful news? And we receive this gift of righteousness by grace through faith. Now think about what righteousness consciousness gives you and gives me. It automatically gives us the next awesome key to successful and powerful prayer, and that is the key of faith. The key of faith. Let's look at this. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all of his ways. Now notice the apostle James says, hey, if you lack wisdom, ask God for wisdom. But do you know that these uh, these concepts that the apostle James mentions here about your approach in prayer don't just work for wisdom, they work for anything you're wanting to receive from God, not being double-minded. He says, let him ask in faith with no doubting. He says, when you doubt, you're like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed back and forth. First, I'm believing God. Then I'm doubting God's going to do what he said. Then I'm believing him. Then I'm doubting uh, what I prayed. It didn't ha- did it work? Did it happen? Is God on it? Back and forth, back and forth. And, and James says, when you do that, you can't receive anything from God because he gives to everybody liberally. And the Bible says in the King James Version, he upbraideth not. He doesn't withhold. Um, uh, he gives liberally and without reproach. God likes to give. God is a giver. (laughs) The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither the shadow of turning in James chapter 1 and verse 17. And so think about that. He gives to everybody liberally and he doesn't hold back. And since we know that, we should be able to say, I believe I receive the wisdom of God for this situation or whatever it is I'm facing. I believe I receive and not doubt and no, uh, not go back and forth and become unstable, but rest in the quiet assurance that he gives when we ask that he is a wonderful, faithful God who gives. We can approach in faith. Now, how do I maintain my faith? How do I stay full of faith? I love the book of Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 8. Moses has died. Joshua is tasked with taking over the whole promised land that Moses never got to go into. And he is given instructions. And the instructions are in Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You know, your word level has to do with your faith level. But here's the thing. You can have a lot of biblical knowledge that you've learned over decades of time, But you've got to maintain your faith level in the now. What do I mean by that? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, So then, faith faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Faith, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing. Whatever you hear and hear builds up 
in your mind, whatever you look at, whatever you listen to, whatever you talk about. These are the things that get in your heart and get in your mind. And when you're full of the word, because you've been talking the word, speaking the word, reading the word, day and night, you're full of the word. And when you're full of the word, you automatically have a fresh rhema word of faith, the now word of God in your heart, and you're full of faith. When you're full of faith, it's easy to receive from God because you're full of the truth and the truth keeps you free and the truth fills your heart so that the the word is working in your heart and the word is coming out of your mouth. Now, not only is it that now faith is that makes up our faith, but Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 says this, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Think about this. Sarah judged God faithful who had promised. The Bible says she received strength to conceive seed. Now, what does this mean? This means that it's not just the promises of God. The promises of God are one pillar are one of the two pillars that make up your faith. Now think about this. If somebody doesn't believe in God and you give them a promise of God, he forgives all your iniquities, he heals all your diseases, and they're not in a position to receive, they don't believe in who God is, they don't know God, they don't put any stock in those promises. They, they think it's weird that you believe in healing and divine protection and that angels work on your behalf and all these things that you believe and that you have eternal life and there's an afterlife. If they're not believers, they don't know God. They don't know who God is. They don't know the character of God and they don't know the faithfulness of God. And the Bible says that Sarah, because she judged him faithful. See, you have to make a judgment. You make character judgments all the time. You judge people all the time. You judge them by, the Bible says we should judge people by their fruit. We should evaluate the fruit that follows their life. We should look at the wake behind their life and be able to make uh, um, um, judgments about the fruit in their life and what's following them. And and so anyway, when we look at, you know, it doesn't mean that we condemn people, but we do use judgment. We do evaluate people's lifestyles. If you think you don't, if you have kids and you just let them stay with anybody, you know, you probably wouldn't let your kids, uh, you know, stay at somebody's house that was previously uh, convicted as a child molester or a child abuser. If if you would, then you, some, your head's not screwed on right. You don't have any common sense, right? So no, we make judgments to think we don't is wrong. And Sarah made a judgment about God. Here's what she did. She said, God, you are faithful. I have seen you work in my life over years of time, and I am judging you faithful. So what did you say? Since you are faithful, now whatever you say carries weight, carries power, carries authority, and I can believe it because I know the kind of God you are. The Bible says in Numbers twenty three nineteen, God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? God can't lie. This is his nature. This is his character. Sarah said, I know you're not a liar, God. I know you're faithful. I know you will do exactly what you said you will do because I believe that you are faithful. And so what did you say, Father? What did you promise me? And so she looked at God's promise in her life. And that's the other pillar of faith in your life. The one pillar is judging the the character and the nature of God and judging him faithful. The other pillar of your faith is saying, what did you say? What is your promise? Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, all the promises of God find their yes and find their amen in Jesus. Jesus is the yes and the amen of God. Hallelujah. All the promises of God, they're yes and amen. So God has made these promises and they belong to you and they belong to me. And all we have to do is say, Father, I judge you faithful. I believe you'll do what you said you will do. And this is the promise of God. Do you need healing today? It's so simple. Father, you are faithful 
And whatever you said, I believe. You could go to Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your disease. Think about that. God forgives your iniquities and he heals all your diseases disease. And you could take that verse and say, God, you are faithful. If you said you forgive all my iniquities, I believe I'm completely forgiven. Hallelujah. I am completely forgiven. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And therefore, because sin is wiped out because of the blood of Jesus, and because I'm forgiven, if there's no sin Sickness and disease wouldn't even exist. It didn't come into the earth until and as a byproduct of sin, of Adam's sin brought death and sickness and disease is a manifestation of death. And if I have sickness and disease trying to manifest in my body, that is illegal. If I'm righteous, there would be no legal grounds for sickness and disease to have access to me or even the curse to have access on the earth. Therefore, because I'm righteous by the blood of Jesus, sickness is illegal. I don't get sickness. It's not part of my inheritance because I get to live in physical divine health just as if sin never existed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, are you saying that you're never physically going to die? No, I'm saying I can live in divine health all the days of my life. Glory to God because of the blood of Jesus and because he paid. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes I am healed, Isaiah 53 says. Isn't that good news? It's really good news for you and me, what Jesus did. The Bible says, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. 1 Peter 2.24, guess what? If I am healed, if I was healed, I am healed. Hallelujah. If I were healed, I am healed. That's what I get. I get to live in the finished work of the covenant, the new covenant that Jesus paid for me to have divine blessing, divine prosperity, divine peace, divine joy, divine life. Hallelujah. I get this because of what he did. And because I simply realized I've been raised up together and I'm seated together in Christ and in him. I live and move and have my being and I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then I'm hidden with Christ in God. Hallelujah. I'm a member of the body of the anointed Jesus and his anointing. The Bible says, what fellowship has Christ with Belial? What does that mean? It means he has become, I've been, the Bible says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You're one spirit with the Lord. Where does Jesus begin, end, and you begin? You've been made one with him. You're part of his body. I'm part of his body. Isn't that awesome? I get it. He's the head. And we're, we're the body, but he represents us in heaven and we represent him in earth. And so he is in me and his divine life is quickening my mortal body every day. That divine life can quicken your mortal body, driving out sickness and disease and anything that would try and up, um, uh, come against you. Hallelujah. Because of the presence, the manifested presence, the manifested glory of God that lives inside you. Isn't that good news? Oh, Father, we bless you tonight. We worship you tonight. We thank you for the divine life, the divine healing, the divine glory that belongs to us as sons of God. Because because of the glory, because of the uh, being justified by faith, the glory of God is ours to enjoy. The presence and power of God belongs to us. We have access into this grace in which we, we stand. Hallelujah. We stand in the grace of God. We stand in the glory of God. We stand as the beloved sons of God. You are a beloved son of God. I am a beloved son of God. And when you understand these things, when this is your heart posture, you live in prayer. You pray without ceasing because you maintain a heart communion with the Father 
all the time. As much as you breathe, you're taking him in and you're releasing him on all the time. As you're walking through life, you are receiving from heaven and then heaven is filling you up and then heaven is pouring out of you all the time, affecting those around you. You know, um, I'll just share a quick testimony. I remember that about the manifest presence of God that we get to walk in and live in, that's, that's walking in the communion and power of God. You can have that today. You can walk in the presence, in the manifest presence of God. I remember I was working uh, with a woman like 25 years ago in a jewelry store, and she wasn't walking with God at the time. But uh, a room, uh, uh, another student and I were going to Raymond Bible Training Center at the time, and we would spend three hours every morning uh, receiving from the presence and power of God in these in these classes, being taught by some of the greatest Bible teachers on earth and spending time in prayer and worship and just getting full of God. And then we would go to work that day. And I remember we'd go to work and, and this other brother that I knew would go to work. And later that, that woman that we worked with um, came back to God, came back to Jesus and got her heart right with Jesus. And she told us when you guys would walk in, before you would even get in the store, I would feel the presence of God coming before you. And I would physically feel that you carried the presence of God. Beloved, you carry the presence of God with you. If you live in fellowship with God, you carry him within you. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1, I think it's verse 27. This is the mystery from ages and generations that was hid that all the apostles and prophets from past wanted to know about. This mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, is living in the manifested presence of God all the time, living with Christ in you. And when Christ is living in you and you're maintaining these heart postures, you're receiving from God, you're breathing him in, and you're also, even without being aware of it, you're releasing him everywhere you go. And he's affecting others through you. Peter did this in Acts chapter 5. The Bible says that, just him walking down the street, that if his shadow would fall on people, they would be healed. And so they started planning every morning, where's Peter going to go today? Is he going to go to the grocery store, the gas station? First, let's lay the people out so that if he's planning to go there, when he walks past and his shadow overshadows them, they're going to get healed. Hallelujah. What a privilege to be a son of God. What a privilege to be a carrier of the glory and presence of God and to live in prayer and to live in fellowship and to live in communion with God. Hallelujah. Well, it's been exciting to talk to you about these heart postures tonight, just to kind of introduce this to you. Um, you know, recapping these heart postures to approach God in prayer is humility honor and respect, boldness and confidence, righteousness, confidence, and faith. As we go on talking about faith, think about this. Um, we see the prayer of a righteous man in action. We see Jesus praying. We see Elijah praying. We see the results of what it looks like to be a person of prayer and to live uh, with these heart postures and be effective in prayer. Think about this. James chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What does that mean? It means he could sin. He could get mad. He could miss it just like you and just like me. In other words, he still had his human nature. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Look at that. His prayer was so powerful. He could control the atmosphere on planet earth by his prayers. He could turn the rain off and he could shut up the heavens by his prayer because he knew who he was. Now, wait a minute. He lived in the old covenant. We have a better covenant, the new covenant, established upon better promises. If he could do that under the old covenant, you better sure believe we can do that under the new covenant with your prayer. If you see a tornado, you take authority over that tornado in Jesus' name. You have the authority over the winds and the waves. Jesus demonstrated that. And in the new covenant, if Elijah could do it, if Elisha could do it, then you and I can do the same thing. We have a better covenant established upon better promises. This is 
is a picture of a man who knew who he was praying. Now think about the greatest picture of prayer I love is the picture of Jesus at prayer. And you might remember that Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick. And he said, ah, we're not going to go to him now. And uh, he's, he's taking a rest. And the disciples are like, great, he's resting, he'll get better. And Jesus is like, nope, he's not resting, he's dead. But I'm going to go and I'm going to wake him up. And so Jesus shows up and everybody is mourning. He's been dead four days, four days dead. Not only is he dead, he stinks. You may have a situation that looked like it died long ago and it's so dead it stinks. And it's that stink, that stench is in your nostrils. And that stench is saying, this is hopeless. This is beyond the purview, the scope of God to fix, to uh, remedy your situation. Jesus faced a situation like that. Look at how he prayed. So he comes to uh, raise Lazarus from the dead. And here's how he prays. I love this. One of the most powerful passages in prayer in the whole New Testament. John chapter 11, verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because the people who were standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Look at this. Jesus didn't even request for Lazarus to be raised. He just said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I know that you hear me always. And the only reason I'm praying this prayer is that so these guys standing around will know who I am and that you sent me. Isn't that awesome? This is a, this is what the new creation, the new covenant looks like in prayer. Hallelujah. Think of praying like that, not praying, hoping God would answer, but knowing that God hears you always and that all the promises of God are yes and amen and that uh, his promises are yes and amen and that you judge him faithful who promise. You look back on the track record of your life. You say, God, you're faithful. You promised and you did it just like you said you would do it. Finally, the last verse that I want to end with is James chapter 5 and verse 16. And years ago, the Lord led me to look up this verse and look up all the Greek words in this verse and their various meetings and extrapolate those meetings and, and put it all together in one verse. So this is James chapter 5 and verse 16. And it's kind of like my own Greek expansion where I've taken these words and you can hear what all of these words mean in this verse. It's so powerful. It says this, uh, James 5, 16, the active, operative, powerful, glowing, intense, passionate prayer of a virtuous, innocent, upright man whose will is wholly conformed to God is an extraordinarily strong force that exerts and wields tremendously great power and is a force to be reckoned with. I'm sorry, I have to read that again. The active, operative, powerful, glowing, intense, passionate prayer of a virtuous, innocent, upright man whose will is wholly conformed to God is an extraordinarily strong force that exerts and wields tremendously great power and is a force to be reckoned with. Do you know that your prayers are tremendously powerful and a force to be reckoned with? Hallelujah. You have the ability by prayer to unleash unimaginable power that could reach the coldest heart, that could reach the person that you thought is impossible to reach. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whichever way he wants. Your prayer can affect presidents. Your prayer can affect kings. Your prayer can affect time and eternity. Don't ever give up on your prayer. Don't ever stop praying. Your prayer stops hell and your prayer unleashes heaven. We need to get stirred up in prayer. We need to realize the power we have in prayer. Ha. Huh. The Bible talks about if you maintain a living communion with me and my words are at home in you, I command you to ask at once something for yourselves, whatever your heart desires, and it will become yours. John fifteen seven, 
in the Weiss translation. The Bible goes on to say, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Part of being a disciple of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a disciple of Jesus, a follower, a disciplined follower of Jesus is being a person of prayer and a person who bears fruit in prayer. When you pray, your prayers are eternal. They go into the Father and they last forever. Your prayers will outlive your time on planet Earth. There are prayers today that are still uh, crying out to God at his throne that were prayed eons ago. Hallelujah. We are inheritors of the prayers of previous generations, but let's not live on the prayers of previous generations. Let's be a people who takes the baton of prayer and runs forward with the baton of prayer to keep prayer going, to grow in prayer. And listen, one of the greatest ways to learn to pray more powerfully and effectively is to just pray. Just do it. Nike has a slogan, just do it. With your prayer life, the best thing you can do is after you've learned, after you've been taught, just do it. You're going to learn how to move with the Holy Spirit, how to yield to the Holy Spirit, how to let him energize your prayers. Yes, there's many types of prayer. What prayer do I pray for when? Holy Spirit will energize you. He will give you an unction to function in prayer, and he will energize your prayers. He will help you in prayer. Praying in tongues will help you in prayer. But I want to encourage you, just do it. Just go for it. Just pray. And when you pray, you will have great and powerful results, and you'll grow in prayer, and you'll see your prayer having impact in the lives of people having impact in the city and place that you live and having impact for the plan and the purpose of God for the ages, ages. And you will be used by God to literally change the world through prayer. Hallelujah. Well, I'm excited about this tonight. I'm excited that I've been able to come into your home and talk to you about prayer. And hopefully you've gleaned some things on how to pray, how to approach God in prayer and how to get maximum results. I want to see you thrive in prayer, and I know God does too. He loves it when we thrive in prayer. I'm going back to my Facebook page for a minute, and uh, I'm excited, everybody that's been able to tune in. If this has been a blessing to you, and it's helped you, I just want to encourage you to share this broadcast on uh, Facebook, share it out on social media so that um, people can get the benefit, that people can get the blessing, that they can get this teaching. Also, if this teaching has been a blessing to you, the Bible says, let him that is taught in the word communicate with him in every good thing. Uh, with him that teacheth. What does that mean? It means when you're taught the word of God, it's appropriate to sow financially into those that teach the word of God. And so I want to ask you that if you've been blessed by this broadcast, if this has helped you, if this has blessed you, I want to ask you to sow a seed. You can go right there at our Facebook page. Uh, I put in our um, in our comment section there where you can click, take you on our website, uh, and you can sow a seed. You can sow a seed through uh, Easy Tithe, a very simple way to sow a seed. But I want to encourage you to release a faith, uh, a faith seed into this teaching um, that you're releasing and name that seed and, and say, Father, I'm releasing a faith seed to be a blessing, but also to reap a harvest of revelation and prayer and to receive a financial harvest on the seed that I sow. When you sow a seed, one of the greatest things you can do is to sow in faith, sow in love, and sow with a right heart motive to build the kingdom of God. It's sowing, financial sowing, and your prayers are helping us to preach the gospel around the world through media, and we appreciate that. And there's greater things we want to do. There's other platforms we want to go on, and as the finances come in to do that, we want to reach more and more people with the gospel, and you're helping us do that. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for divine healing in your body. If there's anybody that needs healing, I want to pray for financial breakthrough. And if you're sowing a seed, just release your faith with me. Father, I just want to say thank you for this time I've had with my brothers and sisters. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name right now for everyone sowing a seed, Father, that you would cause financial breakthrough to happen in their life, that you would multiply back to them their seed sown, and they would see whatever it is they need, every need met and beyond, exceedingly abundantly above 
all they can ask or think. Father, I thank you for the overflow because you're a too much God coming into their life. And in the name of Jesus, I speak the word of faith and I speak to the mountain of sickness and disease that would try and come against them. I command all sickness and disease, every demonic spirit of infirmity and sickness to be bound and to leave your body in Jesus' name. And I loose the healing power of God into your body. Father, I thank you for total healing and deliverance and joy and peace. And Father, I thank you for fresh oil, fresh anointing, fresh glory coming upon every person. Father, for you to fill them with joy, (laughs) joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because Father, we get to live in heaven and on earth at the same time. And we get to live in your glory and in your presence. It's been so good being with you tonight. My name is James Fortune, and I pastor Oasis Church. 